By the time Nvidia noticed something was wrong, nothing looked broken. The servers were full, the contracts were signed, the stock kept climbing. But across shipping lanes and fiber routes, Huawei systems were being switched on in places Nvidia never reached. Not as a test, as the default. Governments weren't waiting for permission. They weren't defying anyone. They were just building with what worked, what arrived first, and what didn't depend on America. And when that pattern set in, it didn't announce itself. It simply stopped needing NVIDIA at all. A year ago, this outcome was treated as impossible. The entire purpose of U.S. export controls was to prevent China from developing advanced artificial intelligence at all. Reuters reported at the time that Washington's strategy was to freeze Chinese firms several generations behind the frontier. Policymakers were told American companies were years ahead and would remain so. China's Belt and Road Initiative was described as bloated, debt-heavy, and failing. Establishment Washington openly celebrated its supposed decline. That confidence hardened into policy. Western technology companies were cut off from China deliberately. The Chinese semiconductor market was conceded by design. The assumption was clear deny access, force dependency, and China would stall. When Jensen Huang later warned that the Chinese market should not be conceded, the decision had already been executed. This was not a misstep. It was the intended outcome. China responded by doing exactly what the sanctions required. Locked out of Western chips and tools, Chinese firms built their own. Over the past year, Huawei and other domestic companies developed AI processors, software platforms, and cloud systems that function independently of U.S. technology. Financial Times reporting shows those systems are now being exported abroad, using a familiar framework. The Belt and Road Initiative has become the distribution channel. Huawei had already laid the groundwork. For years, it built fifth-generation telecom infrastructure across Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Reuters has documented how Huawei equipment underpins national communication systems in dozens of countries. Those networks determine standards. Once installed, they define compatibility, software layers, and upgrade paths. Artificial intelligence systems are deployed on top of what already exists. Huawei does not dominate these markets by selling at a loss. It dominates them because it can build cheaper and faster than anyone else. The reason is Gallium. Gallium is essential for 5G telecommunications hardware. U.S. Geological Survey data cited by the Wall Street Journal show China controls most of the world's gallium refining capacity. When Beijing restricted exports, the effects were immediate. The White House acknowledged the vulnerability. Nokia and Ericsson warned investors of supply risks. Huawei did not. Bloomberg reported that Huawei continued shipping advanced base stations while Western competitors struggled. Gallium nitride components allow higher efficiency, lower heat, stronger signal transmission, and smaller equipment footprints. In telecom hardware, those characteristics determine deployment speed and cost. Huawei's access to gallium translated directly into market dominance. Affordable 5G deployments accelerated across belt and road countries. Once those networks were live, Huawei supplied the next layer's cloud infrastructure, edge computing, and artificial intelligence systems designed to operate on its own chips. Another fault line is opening that does not show up in earnings calls. It sits inside the standards bodies that decide how artificial intelligence systems talk to networks. Chinese engineers are now chairing or co-chairing working groups at the International Telecommunication Union and other technical forums that define next-generation telecom and edge AI protocols. Reuters reported this year that Chinese participation in these committees has surged, while U.S. and European representation has thinned due to budget constraints and fragmented industry backing. Standards written there do not mention companies by name, but they quietly favor architectures already deployed at scale. Huawei's hardware fits them cleanly. Software is drifting with the hardware. NVIDIA's QDA platform still dominates advanced AI training in the West, but Huawei's alternative stack is spreading wherever Huawei networks already exist. According to reporting by the Financial Times, Huawei's KANN and Mindspore frameworks are being adopted by universities, telecom operators, and government labs across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East because they are bundled, subsidized, and locally supported. Developers trained on those systems are not waiting for CUDA access. They are building careers inside a different ecosystem. This divergence is, uh, sharper at the edge. Most AI deployed globally does not train trillion parameter models. Instead, it runs inference close to where data is generated. Like, you know, cameras, ports, factories, and traffic systems. Huawei's chips are optimized for that workload. Bloomberg noted earlier this year that Huawei's Ascend processors trade raw peak performance for power efficiency and integration with telecom infrastructure. In countries where electricity and cooling are scarce, that trade-off actually wins contracts. 
Financing accelerates the spread. Chinese policy banks are offering long-dated loans tied directly to digital infrastructure projects. According to World Bank tracking, these packages increasingly bundle fiber, 5G, data centers, and AI platforms into single contracts. Western competitors typically bid piece by piece, so governments choosing between them are really choosing simplicity. Once signed, the technology stack arrives as a unit. The shift is beginning to reach U.S. allies. Reuters reported that several European telecom operators are quietly testing Huawei AI systems at the edge of their networks, even where core 5G equipment was restricted. The justification is pragmatic. AI workloads at base stations reduce latency and operating costs. Regulators tolerate the trials because they sit outside the most politically sensitive layers. The separation is technical, not strategic, and it narrows with every deployment. Inside China, manufacturing yields are improving. Industry analysts cited by the Wall Street Journal reported that domestic foundries are producing AI accelerators with acceptable yields at mature process nodes. These chips do not match NVIDIA's most advanced offerings, but they no longer need to. They are good enough, available in volume, and tightly coupled to local software. Scale compensates for elegance. The market response reflects this shift. Venture capital data compiled by PitchBook and referenced by the New York Times show rising investment into AI startups building specifically for Chinese hardware stacks. These companies are not positioning themselves as global challengers to open AI or NVIDIA. They are positioning themselves as default suppliers inside the fastest growing digital regions. The long risk for NVIDIA is not displacement at the frontier, it is normalization elsewhere. Once developers, governments, and operators grow comfortable with an alternative that works, switching back becomes optional rather than necessary. Optional technologies rarely dominate. By the time export controls adjust again, the center of gravity may have moved. Not loudly, not ceremonially, just far enough that the next generation of infrastructure no longer assumes American chips at its core. Those AI systems are already in use. Reuters reported that governments across multiple regions are deploying Chinese-built AI for traffic systems, logistics management, surveillance, and public services. These deployments are optimized for Huawei hardware. NVIDIA chips are not part of the architecture. Inside China, NVIDIA's position collapsed. Financial Times reporting shows NVIDIA's market share in China fell from roughly 95% to effectively zero. Demand did not disappear. Substitutes arrived. Huawei and other domestic chip makers filled the gap. These firms were expected to be 5 to 10 years behind. Some analysts believed they would never catch up at all. Those forecasts failed. The assumption that Belt and Road was collapsing failed. The belief that denying access would halt China's AI development failed. The policy produced a self-sufficient competitor with an export strategy. The Trump administration attempted a partial reversal. Reuters reported that NVIDIA received licenses to sell downgraded AI chips to China under a new framework. In exchange, NVIDIA agreed to pay the United States government 15% of sales revenue. The chips were intentionally limited. Access was conditional. China declined. Domestic suppliers were already embedded across data centers and AI platforms. Adopting downgraded NVIDIA chips would have required redesigning entire systems around intentionally weakened hardware. The transaction offered no strategic upside. During meetings with President Donald Trump, NVIDIA's chief executive publicly described Huawei as the most innovative technology company in the world. Reuters and Bloomberg both reported the remarks. A company once framed as technologically isolated was now being acknowledged by its largest rival. Pressure on NVIDIA did not stop at China's border. Artificial intelligence demands electricity at scale. Data centers operate continuously, and AI training clusters, well, they just multiply power consumption. According to projections from the International Energy Agency, which were cited by the Wall Street Journal, data center electricity demand is rising rapidly. In the United States, resistance is growing. Utilities have warned regulators that AI-driven demand is pushing grids toward capacity limits. The New York Times reported that new data center projects are facing delays as electricity prices rise and communities push back. U.S. power generation has actually remained largely flat for more than a decade. Meanwhile, China's demand is rising even faster. Bloomberg's analysis of official Chinese data shows that annual electricity demand growth now equals the total consumption of Germany. At the same time, China is adding roughly twice that amount in new generating capacity every year. Coal, nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar projects are all expanding simultaneously. Even with surging demand, supply is growing faster. Power prices remain lower. Grid expansion continues without prolonged delays. AI infrastructure scales without triggering widespread backlash. In the United States, expansion timelines stretch decades. 
Department of Energy projections show that nuclear energy growth is unfolding slowly, even under optimistic assumptions. Uranium supply remains geopolitically constrained. Reuters has reported that U.S. nuclear fuel supply chains still rely heavily on foreign sources. China is not waiting. Capacity is being built now. Excess supply becomes insurance. Data centers expand without constraint. Power availability becomes part of the export proposition. NVIDIA remains dominant at the frontier of AI training, but, you know, frontier leadership does not guarantee global control. Markets fragment when standards diverge. Ecosystems harden once installed. WTO trade data released in recent months show Chinese high-tech exports growing faster than global trade, while Western semiconductor shipments are kind of flattening out. Two systems are scaling under different constraints. IMF forecasts release this quarter project that emerging markets will account for most global data growth over the next decade. Those markets are choosing their infrastructure today. The systems they adopt now will determine which technologies fade quietly into the background and which ones remain visible because they no longer set the rules. What changed wasn't the technology. It was the assumption. For years, the world was built on the idea that the most advanced systems would always come from the same place, on the same terms, with the same dependencies. That idea quietly expired. Networks were built that didn't wait for approval. Chips were designed that didn't require access. Power was added where demand was growing fastest. And once enough of the future was constructed without asking permission, the question stopped being who leads AI and became who gets invited back in. We're glad you're enjoying this video. Please like and subscribe. Check out another video that is now on your screen.